the other day you were telling me about no your disdain for yeah. the term pan-Africanism. Yes. And I want you to go over that again, where the term originated, what it is about it that you don't like, and what are the competing or alternative phrases that we could use to describe that same kind of ethos and movement and consciousness. Yeah, yeah the term pan-Africanism uh, is, is one that has been ascribed to Marcus Garvey. And he was not, never recognized himself as that, and no one in his day were bold enough to ascribe Pan-Africanism to him. I know most of us think, you know, Pan-Africanism means all African people, and that's a simple definition we're given. But it's a lot more to the history and tradition of the term, the people who ascribe to it, the people who develop the Pan-African movement, as well as, you know, how it's defined today, because Pan-Africanism, uh, which is named after the god Pan, um, the you know ancient European god, a homosexual god, Pan, was the god uh, who used to play his flute or you know some kind of horn instrument, and he would attract people, and the people would follow him. So people who you know followed and come together were you know Pan-Hellenic or Pan this or Pan that. You know there was a lot of Pan movements coming out after World War One or um, you know first part of the century. So. Um, when the Pan-African Association was first formed, it was formed basically by people who were of the talented 10th. People like Henry Sylvester Williams, who was an uh, attorney who, you know, was married to a uh, European. Uh, people like Du Bois, who was, you know, mixed blood, uh, um, European ancestry and African ancestry. Uh, people like Anna Julia Cooper, another, you know, mulatto and other people. And at the original Pan-African Conference, uh, Sir Harry Johnston and certain other colonizers were at the table chairing some of the sessions uh, and the agenda of the Pan-African movement was to internationalize the civil rights movement at that time and so some of these people from all over came and their agenda was weak you know they basically wanted a bill of rights for those people who were colonized in Africa it was um, you know making sure that like you know the children uh, labor laws were respected you know, they didn't overwork people too much. They gave them, um, you know, certain, um, you know, opportunities to heal themselves or rest or whatever they were injured. But there was certain little things in there to make people a little comfortable. But at no time did they ever want or expect or suggest that Africa should be free of colonization, that Africa should be independent. And in fact, when the idea was mentioned later on, you know, Boyce was religiously, he and a few other Pan-Africans of, of his day in the 19... Uh, tens and twenties would say, oh no, no, Africa is not ready, you know, and, you know, we need to um, learn the white Protestant ethic, we need to learn how to become civilized like these Europeans, and then we'll be in a position uh, to govern ourselves, but we're not ready, and he actually recommended some of his mulatto friends would come to Africa and lead and show the people how to be civilized and how to uh, govern. In fact, uh, Du Bois had even said that we don't, wouldn't like Africa, because it's too hot, and we couldn't make it over there as if we didn't come from there in the first place against our will and paradise but the pan-africanism was people who were uh integrationists these people were not black nationalists you know pan-africanism really has no definition just in to say all africa but that could be anything all african gay club it can be an all african um you know party it can be all african whatever but it doesn't tell you what it is now universal african nationalism which is what Garveyism practiced and introduced to the world, uh, a worldwide African nationalism. That's what Garvey preached. Uh, and he warned us that if we get involved with that pan stuff, we're going to be frying with them in the end um, when Africa is liberated. Um, but the, the Garvey's philosophy of universal African nationalism was Africa for the Africans. It's about complete, total um, independence, sovereignty of African people, not just in Africa, but wherever African communities were around the globe. Uh, Mr. Garvey was on fire with the desire for an African empire. And when he called these international conventions, he wasn't talking about, you know, appeasing white folks. He wasn't talking about how to make them comfortable and, and work with their system. He was talking about setting our own system up. And so we, you know, we adopted our own flag. We adopted our own anthems. We started doing things separate and different from the Pan-African Congresses that really accomplished nothing and, and did nothing. It wasn't until 1945 
the things begin to change in the word long after Mr. Garvey died. The word Pan African started getting a more radical uh, um, uh, reputation. And that's when George Padmore, uh, who was a Garveyite, uh, who was part of the Garvey Club at Howard University in Kruma, who was a card carrying member of the Philadelphia Division and uh, Garveyite, Joe Mo Kenyatta, who considered himself a Garveyite and used to, um, you know, hear uh, the Negro world read in, in public square and then go back to his village and, and recite everything that he recalled from the, um, you know, the recitation. But uh, these were the people who spearheaded the call in 1945 for an African People's Congress. Unfortunately, when they submitted the press release to the media to um, announce the African People's Congress, the, pre the press release was misinterpreted as an extension of Du Bois' NAACP-sponsored Pan-African Congress. Uh, the Zionist Jews-sponsored Pan-African Congress. So, um, at, you know, people uh, started saying the Pan-African Congress in 1945, and even though he had a problem with it, he talked to the boys and they, you know, worked it out. You know, the NAACP wasn't going to sponsor the 45 anyway. So the boys said, well, I'll be your honorary chair if you like, since I'm an extension of the old guard and you all can bring in this new radical Pan-African nationalist idea, which was kind of a bastardization of Garveyism with Pan-Africanism. But it wasn't pure, unadulterated Garveyism. So, um, so, so hold on. Mm -hmm. so, so, so what's the link between the NAACP and the original Pan-African concept? Yeah, well, the Pan-African Association started in the 1890s. The first conference was in 1900. And many of the people in that group were of uh, Henry Morehouse's, you know, idea of the talented tenth, of the upper tens or the mixed blood, you know, um, um, race individuals who had the good diction and, you know, who were, um, you know, considered themselves the leaders, natural leaders of the black race and who could, you know, lead the race on into... Uh, prosperity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these, you know, in, uh, colored intellectuals. And colored is another term for mulatto in most cases. Uh, but these colored intellectuals were running the Pan African Conference. They were having intellectual exercises and discourses. And so um, when the NWACP started in 1909, which was a combination of a bunch of Ashkenazi Zionist Jews who came over from Europe, who were considered the half caste of Europe. Uh, therefore the term Semite um, but when these half caste non 100% Aryan um, trans people got transplanted to the US and came and started organizing the civil rights movement they invited the half caste uh, colored intellectuals of America like Du Bois and others and, and um, you know Rayford Logan and uh, James Weldon Johnson and all these people and they started to put together this civil rights movement and so the first 1919 Pan-African Congress not conference, but Congress was uh, sponsored by the NAACP, along with the 1921 and the 23 and the 27, all sponsored by the Zionist NAACP, which was headed uh, for most of that time, if not all of that time, by Joel uh, Spingarn, who was a military intelligence officer in charge of the Negro Subversion Division of Military Intelligence. So his job basically was to spy on black people and report back, you know, to this country in case we were, you know, thinking about some kind of insurrection or. or actually doing something for ourselves, you know, against their interests. So uh, this body of people is what sponsored the NAACP. Some of them were scared to death that Garvey might be some way involved or connected. And so they let everybody know we have nothing to do with that Africa for the African thing. No, will we ever, and that's not what we're pushing here. We don't want to decolonize Africa. You know, we want to do this, that, and the other. So their agenda versus Garvey's agenda was night and day. And, you know, calling Garvey, but some people do a Pan-Africanist, is kind of like calling Malcolm X a civil rights leader. Now, Malcolm said he believed in human rights. And human rights is a lot stronger and bigger than some civil rights. In civil rights, you got to beg a white man for permission to treat you better. But when you have your human rights, you know, you don't have to beg anybody. That's why Mr. Garvey made a declaration of rights of our, our people so that when you declare your rights, you know, free people declare their rights, slaves beg for them. You know, when you have to demand, that means you don't command. You don't have any power. But when you come together as a race, 400 million strong, as we did back in Mr. Garvey's day, he's telling them what they better not do. And, and if they defy us, all of us are going to come together and make sure that um, they pay uh, and be exact justice um, for any injustices afflicted against our people. And that threat, that attitude, you know, they started to develop a shipping line and develop industries that develop, you know, uh, hotels and 
uh, universities and, and you know millionaires, textile industry, you know, everything, and started this worldwide movement of millions of people was a, one of the biggest threats to this country. Pan Africanism was never a threat to this country. Um, it was embraced and financed by you know again those who weren't our friends, those who were heading the NAACP, which sometimes the UNIA members would refer to as nothing accomplished after considerable pretense. So um, yeah, we never associated any tradition with them in the same way you know some people today uh, don't want to associate our struggle with the struggle of the Zionists or the Jewish community and they have their diaspora and their Holocaust we have our Ma'afa and we you know instead of saying diaspora we use Africans at home and abroad but we have a different tradition and different language a different way of seeing things than some of these other folks on this other side and the two are not the same uh, even if you look at uh, um, some modern definitions like the AAPRP often says that uh, Pan-Africanism means the total unification of Africa under science, African scientific socialism. But Mr. Garvey wasn't a socialist. He wasn't a communist and he wasn't even a capitalist. He didn't believe in any of those European ideologies nor thought we had to uh, uh, identify with them. And just because you call it an African socialism or African communism, whatever you want to call it, that's only the chocolate milk effect. You know, milk is not good for you, and you say, oh, I'm just going to blacken it up a little bit, put it in a kente cloth club, cup. It's still milk. It's still nasty, and it's still unhealthy. You know, so you can't just pretty it up and, and put your own words in it and call it something else when you know that it's not originating from you. You know, we've been re regulating countries peacefully, you know, great civilizations long before these Europeans were coming out of the caves. So we don't need to run to them for no ideology. Uh, we're not begging them to accept us. Uh, and most communists who were familiar with Garvey in the end, you know, they would criticize him in the beginning. By the time they went through the muck and mire and got treated bad by the Communist Party uh, of, of different European nations, they came out and said Garvey was right. I wish we had listened. And I'm hoping a lot of the people who use the word pan Africanist just be mindful of it, you know, the history of it in the term. And if you choose to use it, that's on you. I can't tell you what to believe, but if you're a Garveyite, uh, that's not where you ought to embrace uh, so easily and so loosely.